Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure. Actually, I have to thank Patricia yeah. for uh, charging me with this pleasurable duty of uh, introducing uh, Happy PC today. Happy PC today. Um, I'm very grateful to you for this opportunity of introducing our guests. Katia Pizzi is Senior Lecturer of Italian Studies at the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the School of Advanced Studies at the University of London and Director of the Centre for the Study of Culture and Memory at the same institute. You know all this because it was publicised in SESH site. But it's my duty to do this. And you like to listen to me. Anyway. <laughs> she has a vast career as a researcher and lecturer, both in the UK and in many other parts of the world. She's also an experienced peer reviewer and consultant for several European research and publishing institutions. So, be wary of that. Her list of publications as author, co-author and or co-editor is very vast, including books, articles in peer reviewed journals and chapters in books. A multifaceted scholar with five books and 64 articles and chapters published in the UK and overseas, her research interests include, besides modernisms, children's literature, popular culture, culture memory studies, and illustration. I first met Professor Pizzi at an international conference she co-organized with Patricia Silva at what was then the Institute of Germanic and Romance Studies at the University of London in March 1912. The general topic of that conference was peripheral modernisms. Among the long list of Dr. Pizzi's publications in press of upcoming work, there is a book co-edited with Dr. Patricia Silva titled precisely Peripheral Modernisms. Its publication is anxiously expected, including by myself, who contributed an article entitled What is Peripheral about Peripheral Modernisms? The implicit answer to my question is nothing. Nothing is peripheral about peripheral modernisms. This is my way of suggesting that Katia Pizzi, who has written extensively on futurism and other Italian and Italy-related modernisms, is a distinguished scholar of modernism, not of peripheral modernisms. Her most recent book, Italian Futurism and the Machine, announced in this flyer, Italian Futurism and the Machine is forthcoming at Manchester University Press and will prove this true. Her talk today is entitled Transcultural, as you well know, is entitled Transcultural Memories in Trieste. I myself am curious to hear about this peripheral city of intersecting fragmented cultures that is considered by many a paradigm of modernity. Peripheral was between commas. Please help me to welcome once again Professor Kathy Pizzi at SESH. Thank you so much, Maria Ren. This is such a lovely introduction. I, it, it's just a, a little anecdote that uh, in my first job interview more than 20 years ago, I didn't get the job, as you, you will um, surmise. But I was told that I didn't get the job because my research was too peripheral. <laughs> <laughs> so my work on borders was too peripheral. So the job went to an expert on Italo Calvino in oh, It was really very mainstream. Very mainstream. So thank you very much, Maria Rem, and thank you um, the whole staff and colleagues, and Serge and Patrice in particular, who's been looking after me so well this past week uh, while I've been here. I've been asked um, to uh, introduce the work of the centre uh, briefly before I launch into my own um, research piece. So if you will bear with me, I will say a few words. I have a few slides about the centre and also there are flyers on the table which you're welcome to pick up and take away with you with the uh, website and, the, and my own um, email address if you're interested in the activities of the centre. So, this first slide just gives you an idea of where we come from and uh, I'm particularly proud of this uh, Master of Arts uh, which was a taught program that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore because at, um, in about five years ago the school where I work decided to cap the, um, the number of students at uh, a minimum of 12 and we didn't reach the the quorum of students that were needed for the MA, so the MA is in abeyance at the moment. But I'm very proud of this MA, which at the time 
it felt it you know this is the last graduation of 2009 was I think unique and it was the only or the first cultural memory MA master's degree in cultural memory I think in the world certainly in Europe it was founded by Jola Bani before she went to, moved on to uh, NYU and um, it was a fantastic experience which enabled the center to gather uh, capacity and resources because the, the masters was taught by uh, a number of colleagues across various colleges of University of London and beyond so it was a really seminal experience which we're very proud of hopefully we will launch it again in future the uh, Center for the Study of Cultural Memory we call it CCM launched in February 2010 so it's a relatively young center compared with SEJ uh, at the very least and um, the, that conference was uh, also seminal in terms of the activities of the center because it really uh, put the, um, the notion of transcultural memories on the map, or we like to, to believe that it did. If you look at the list of keynote speakers, remember this is 2010, so it was the sort of beginning of transcultural, uh, where transcultural memory studies were, was beginning to emerge, was emergent at the time. And I think the list of keynote speakers really missed uh, the, the main um, exponents of what that has become, you know, the field of transcultural memory studies. Of course, all of these colleagues have now moved on to, to bigger and better things, um, but nonetheless, I, you know, we regard it as one of our you know, founding, foundation stones. Founding stones. Um, more conferences followed conferences, workshops and seminars is one of the reasons why we exist. So we mount, like Serge, we mount events all the time, uh, in part uh, initiated by us uh, in the center or under the suggestion or the organization or co-organization of external uh, colleagues and visiting researchers. Um, I'm highlighting this one in particular, um, which is actually a, a sort of bifurcated event. It was a workshop on Cold War cities and a conference on art histories, cultural studies and the Cold War, uh, because that highlighted some of the main um, areas of interest of the center. One of them is cities, of course, um, and the Cold War, uh, which as you will see uh, came out as a, as a publication after a few years. And um, you see here photos of the delegates of the conference visiting Senate House, which is where we are located physically in London. You may know the building, it's a very uh, prominent library building and prominent building uh, built in the late 1930s with many resonances of the of George Orwell, of course, of the Second World War and of the Cold War itself. So it's, it's a perfect location in terms of memories and memories of the war and the Cold War in particular. Um, another event I'd like to highlight was a conference in 2014 um, uh, entitled Memories of the Future. You see uh, featured here the two keynote speakers, Professor Alberto Abruzzese to the left and Professor Malcolm Quinn to the right. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that um, we are uh, we are holding a further event in this field, another, a big international conference entitled Memories of the Future, next March, March 2019, if you're interested. Um, and it's going to be an update on what we did in this particular conference, which was very uh, geared towards sort of visual cultures and memory. And uh, we're going to expand our uh, uh, list of interests to um, obviously the, the, the um, Anthropocene and climate change, you know, future cities, sparse cities and ecofeminism, which I know is one of the points of interest of your centre, political activism, the future of memory, etc. So if you're interested, please talk to me or look us up because the conference is coming up and it's, it's had a really fantastic res response of, um, uh, of uh, papers and, um, and offers. Um, another important initiative is, of course, in publications, and the Centre holds its own dedicated uh, book series. Uh, the title is Cultural Memories, and it's a collaboration with Peter Lang, publishers of Oxford. So, you know, Peter Lang is sort of spread out in Europe, and there's a particular branch 
in Oxford that we're working with. And um, the series is relatively young. It's only started in 2013. The first title, Margarita Sprio's Migrant Memories, dates back to 2013. We started out slowly. We published one book a year, but it's actually picking up very nicely. And um, the last book that you featured came out a couple of years ago, Networked Remembrance, which is um, uh, a book uh, written by Sam Merrill, who's a sociologist who works at Umea University in Sweden. And the book is about ruins and uh, memories of the underground uh, in Berlin and London and political activism, which I'm also aware is one of the topics of interest of the center. So this is one of our, our you know, really our jewels in our crown. I'm particularly proud of this series, which is building up very nicely. And we now have about or hopefully we'll continue to publish about three titles every year, which, uh, which I think is, is very nice. And last but not least, the Centre welcomes visiting fellows. Um, and we, um, we have a few stipendiary fellowships, but also non-stipendiary visiting fellowships, uh, which everyone is very welcome, particularly in this uh, group. <laughs> You know, because of our shared interests, it's very welcome to apply. Uh, usually the call comes out in the springtime, February, March or April next year, so keep an eye on our website. And it's a very, I promise, very simple form, it's nowhere complicated. And it gives fellows, visiting fellows an opportunity to take part in activities of the centre, uh, help us organise events or organise your own events that you may be interested uh, to do, contribute to publications, and I've just listed a, some select projects. I mean, we've had dozens of fellows visiting. Um, you do, of course, get a, uh, a desk uh, uh, in the premises of Senate House, where we are located. And you also, importantly, get a ticket to all the many libraries that exist in the area. And uh, I think Bloomsbury, as some of you probably know, is one of the most uh, one of the areas with the highest densities of libraries in the world. You know, you have the Warburg Institute Library, Senate House Library, British Library, not far away, UCL Library, Burbank Library. So really, having a ticket to all these libraries, you know, having access to all these libraries is actually quite one of the, one of the sort of strong points of, uh, of selling the centre, as it were. I've just listed a few um, uh, select projects here. Uh, which you may find, you know, some colleagues or people you know. I, I just want to draw your attention maybe to one uh, project, uh, uh, and it's Dr. Alessandro Carlucci, who's based in Oxford, who was with us in 2016 looking at new directions in Gramsci scholarship. And of course, um, 2017 was an anniversary of Antonio Gramsci's death, and we had a big bash. I mean, with Alessandro, we organized a workshop and a conference in honor of Antonio Gramsci, but in 2017 there was a much bigger and, um, and an event that I'm extremely proud of that the Centre was involved with when the Italian Cultural Institute in London brought for the first time Gramsci's prison notebooks to London to be viewed, the originals to be viewed by the general public. So the, the prison notebooks had never left Italy before and it was a big event, and I'm very proud that the centre was associated with this event. So, um, this is the end of, of my intro, intro to the centre. I don't know if you want to ask questions now, or are you happy for me to sort of seamlessly seep into the, the, the talk, or do you want to have a, a question break at this point, whichever is okay with me? No, okay, so I'll, I'll move on. Okay, to my own thing. I'm impressed by the <laughs> Okay. Well, I hope, you know, if you want to talk to me about it, either in this context or later, I'm here all week, and uh, please look us up and pick up some of the literature that I want here today. So, um, this paper is, um, is a, really a showcase of my own research and it, I have to say, uh, to begin with, that is in no mean, by no means completely paradigmatic of the centre itself. 
Um, I mean, obviously, my own research touches many, uh, uh, many points of interest of the center, cities, uh, transcultural memories, uh, trauma studies, the Holocaust, Holocaust studies. But on the other hand, I'm very keen for the center to remain a very broad and inclusive um, forum where memory is understood in a very broad way way, you know, rather than try and sort of specialize the center in, in, a, in a specific direction, as many other centers for memory studies are, I'm really very interested in keeping, you know, keeping it inclusive. And in particular, I'm interested in keeping a sort of dialogue open with history and historical studies, because it's frequently said that memory studies and historical studies are not very dialogical. Uh, Historians uh, sort of regard memory studies with some degree of skepticism. Memory um, scholars, you know, think historians don't really go far enough. So I think it would be good if the centre continued to reflect and, and, and be inclusive of, uh, of uh, various disciplines um, in a dialogical manner rather than in, um, in, in, you know, in conflict. So I begin with a quotation by Andreas Usen, I quote, Cities are palimpsests of history, incarnations of time in stone, sites of memory extending both in time and space, end of quote. Of course, the palimpsest is the material support upon which the present inscribes itself, overwriting the superimposed traces of multiple pasts. As such, the palimpsest stands as an exquisite, by now almost formulaic, metaphor for the memorial process and the dynamics through which memory is encoded. Trieste, of course, lends itself productively to a palimpsest hermeneutic. And here is a, a, a slide that shows you the location of, of Trieste at the northeastern borders of Italy, bordering to what uh, is former Yugoslavia and is now Slovenia and Croatia to the, to, the, um, to the east and the south and Austria to the north. A harbour located in a cul-de-sac in the upper Adriatic Sea at the far northeastern edges of Italy, Trieste is both a peripheral and transcultural city. Periodically de-signified and re-signified, the urban palimpsest is made up of fragmented memories colliding and continuously reconstituting into new forms. This is a steel engraving dating uh, to 1840 that shows you Trieste and the title is quite, um, is quite significant, is quite uh, resonant. The title is The Imperial Riviera. It's when Trieste was really the Riviera of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. The city arose ex novo in the late 18th century, responding to Austria-Hungary's need of a coastal outlet to pursue maritime commerce. The establishment of a free port and injection of European capital followed suit, allowing diverse cultural, linguistic and religious communities to trade and thrive at this key geopolitical junction. In the late 19th century, Trieste became one of the major ports in the world. In the Mediterranean Sea alone, it was second only to Marseille. So, really, very rapid growth and import of, of importance. Culturally speaking, Trieste has historically encompassed East and West, acting as a gateway to what Maria Todorova calls, I quote, the transitory step transitionary status of the Balkans. And of course, um, during, particularly during the Second World War and the Cold War, Trieste was to become simultaneously a conduit to the East, but also a bulwark against the East, as we shall see in a moment. Languages and cultures coexisted in jarring cacophonies, while the city's composite national and ethnic makeups stoked up internal division. Both 
peripheral and cosmopolitan, a, very, a veritable crucible of languages and cultures, but, as LURP has pertinently observed, mostly a crucible manqué, so it's not really, it would like to be a crucible, but it wasn't really a crucible. In the early years of the 20th century, this multicultural shore proved attractive to the cultural avant-garde, from James Joyce to Freud, from the futurist to Schwechko Kosovo. And I've put in this slide some of the uh, uh, authors or uh, important intellectuals who were, who are, were associated with Trieste, Italo Svevo, of course, on the Italian side, but also, importantly, the Slovenian poet Schwechko Kosovo, featured in the uh, upper left uh, um, uh, photograph, who was a very fine constructivist poet who died in 1926, and he's one of uh, you know, the main, main uh, exponents of Slovenian poetry. James Joyce, of course, we all know, was attracted by Trieste, spent a few productive years there, beginning to draft his Ulysses, uh, before moving on to Paris, where, you know, the Ulysses became, you know, became what, what it now is, <laughs> a reality. And also, perhaps not um, as well known, Sigmund Freud pursued his uh, medical training at Trieste, so he was, he was there for part of the time. So, as you said, Maria, uh, Irene, contradictory and plurivocal, Trieste is still regarded today as a paradigm of modernity itself and the fragmented status of modern literary culture. Uh, Last year, the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the BBC Wreath Lectures. Every year the BBC uh, uh, um, sort of features a series of lectures, usually given by prominent intellectuals. And last year, Kwame Anthony Apaya uh, gave the series of brief lectures. And what did he begin with? He began talking about Trieste and Ditoros Vego as paradigms, of, uh, as epitome of modern literary culture. However, the history is very traumatic and very, uh, you know, th there are uh, traumatic historical vicissitudes that tear apart, that tear apart, or tore apart the city, and Trieste was typified by the coexistence of conflictual and what John Foot calls fractured memories. So, memories that are broken and unreconciled, that are jarring memories. Trieste truly was, and is, a city in search of an identity, a city in search of an author. Monuments and memorials pockmark the cityscape and the surrounding caste region, fomenting divisive politics currently as much as they did in the past. I mean, obviously, now the, the geopolitical configuration is very different, but there's still uh, divisions and, and sort of jarring memories They continue to... Uh, to, um, to agitate the, the city. So today I'm going to look at some key sites of contested memories, specific locales where the fractured and fragmented memories of Trieste have come to the fore with particular force. And um, I suggested in my abstract when, uh, when I sent it a few weeks ago that I was going to look at Riziera di San Saba, who's a former uh, concentration camp, a transit camp, that is connected with Holocaust memories. I was going to look at the Feuber pits, which are caves and crevices that were used as sites of atrocities during the Second World War. And I was also going to look at an immaterial site of contested memory, which was film, cinema, particularly cinema during the Cold War era. But I've decided, in order not to pack too much in, to leave the immaterial site, to leave cinema out for the moment and to focus on the material, the, the sort of locative sites, Riziera and Foibe. So the first site I will be looking at is Riziera di San Saba. This is, uh, um, was a detention camp set up in 1943. The Foibe, on the other hand, were local pits, as I mentioned, deployed as sites of atrocity in 1943 and 1945. And here, before I launch into, uh, into talking about uh, Rizier and Feuerbe, I really need to put forward a disclaimer, a very important disclaimer, so please hear me out, um, because I'm often 
sometimes um, when I discuss these two sides, I'm uh, accused of sort of trying to bring them together. Of course, I'm not. Rizera is, of course, entirely specific and independent from the Feuerwehr side. The two sides follow independent trajectories of history. I have to stress that no affinity whatsoever exists between these two sides. In fact, you could argue that opposite strategies of uh, remembering are at work in these sites. And you could argue that, for instance, Rizera is um, affected much more, or is mostly affected by amnesia or forgetfulness, whereas the Feuerbe pits are rather uh, characterized by an echnesia, so a memory disorder which consists in reliving past events as present. Okay, so the, the memorial strategies at, two, at these two sites are polar opposites. So, that said, these two sides are entirely different. However, they're both compelling in terms of their respective broken memorial dynamics. And what I'm, I would like to look at today is these specific broken <coughs> memorial dynamic, dynamics that characterize these two sides. These sites bear witness to complex processes of memorialization where both indigenous and immigrant communities and their competing nationalisms lay claim to power and cultural production. These memories cast enduring shadows over the present time, not so much in the Derridean sense of ghosting, but rather, what I find most productive, in the manner of overlaying traces on par parchment paper, like a palimpsest. So I'd like to look at some of the memorialization processes that underpin these sites. Now, before I, I look at the, at the sites uh, specifically, I would like to um, spend a little bit of time to, um, to give you a, a bit of a, a theoretical framework of, uh, of, um, of where my research, as concerns these sites, is situated. So my conceptual arsenal draws on Pierre Nora's lieu de mémoire, of course, and the lieu de mémoire are national sites and memorials designed to cement a specific national identity, as we know. After the First World War and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Italian middle class elite supported the Italian national cause to the detriment of the rising national consciousness of autochthon Slovenian and Croatian communities. The erection of monumental war cemeteries in Redipuglia and other commemorative statues to the unknown soldier were part and parcel of this strategy. And there's quite a lot of really significant and upcoming brilliant research on, on these sites, particularly by um, Gaetano Dato. Jay Winter was one of the first scholars to revisit First World War, World War memorials in a transnational key with special emphasis on the languages and the protocols of mourning and commemoration. Alain Confino, in particular, raised a fitting point when he contended that the power to make memory significant lies in processes that bring different mnemonic communities to clash over their respective understanding of the past. So I think this is particularly fitting of the Trieste Memorial landscape, where different ethnic and national communities come to clash over me memories. So where, in other words, transcultural memories are problematic, they're not smooth. The substantial and growing fields of trauma studies and Holocaust studies, of course, have further offered a range of pertinent contributions to this debate. And I'm not going to go into this because there's a vast amount of scholarships um, of scholarship here, uh, both in trauma studies and uh, Holocaust studies that could be deployed very uh, effectively to, to sort of investigate these sites. I think for the moment um, this will have to suffice, but we, we, can, we can sort of come back to it during the, the questions. More recent critiques, notably by Astrid Erl and Rigny and Michael Rothberg, 
have broadened the national scope of memory, calling for transcultural frameworks, nodes of memory, and multidirectional transfers across space and time. Of course, as Patrizia Violi has also pertinently suggested, located memory is a process rather than a static ontology. Further, the drift of memory is underpinned by archaeological layering and traceable flows, as Husserl suggestively implies. Finally, the Warburg historian Michael Baxendahl adds what I find uh, really pertinent insights. And Baxendahl says that the tectonic, the perpetual erosion, erosion of the sand dune, what Baxendahl calls its lamination, is paradigmatic of memorial dynamics that typify post-conflict societies. Baxendahl's model seems to me, in particular, to be extremely productive, as it puts special emphasis on the slippage, the ruptures, the ambiguities and fragilities, the overlaps underlying the memorial process, providing a convincing hermeneutic of Trieste's main memorial sites. So I'm, I'm going to look at them in this light in particular. So, Risiera di San Saba is the first um, memorial site I'm going to look at. And the geopolitical context is, of course, the zones of operation, the, the site that is marked in red on this map uh, to the left, the zone of operations Adriatisches Küstenland, which was the district on the North Adriatic coast created by Nazi Germany in 1943, which was previously under Italian fascist rule. The compound of Risiera was not built specifically as, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, um, as a site, but the building was already there. Um, in fact, the camp was set up on the premises of a 19th century factory which um, used to be specialized in husking rice, from where the name comes. Risiera means where rice, where rice is husked, on an industrial scale. The camp, unlike other Holocaust, or other, um, uh, other camps, um, was not located in a remote rural area, but rather in the heart of the city, in the heart of Trieste. So in this way, uh, Risiera was unique, because most camps were erected really far out, where really they couldn't be seen or they couldn't be heard very much um, in remote rural spots, whereas Risiera is bang in the middle of the city. Um, of course, one of the ideas was to um, act as a deterrent in the face of Eastern Europe, so in the face of communism, and to, to sort of pose a very uh, compelling deterrent and, and opposition to that. The template for this camp um, was Treblinka, which I featured in the other um, uh, image. And um, Treblinka really offered a template uh, for how Riziera then uh, looked like. The various key um, officers of Treblinka were uh, moved to Riziera in order to set it up. So Franz Stangl in particular, uh, a man infamously known as the executioner of Treblinka, was uh, moved to Riziera in order to set it up, together with various other um, key exponents, uh, uh, including Odilo Globocznik, who became one of the, um, the commandant of Riziera, and Irvin Lambert, who designed the crematorium, the, um, the, um, the, um, the oven. Now, Risiera was also unique, not only for being uh, set up in the heart of a city, in the middle of an urban, uh, uh, of an urban uh, locale, but also for, um, um, for the, for the status of its victims. Um, the, um, the number of victims is, not, is estimated as not being uh, enormous. It's estimated between three to 5,000 uh, uh, units, as it were. Um, 
Rizera was used mainly as a transit camp rather than as a, an extermination camp. But the, the, the status and, uh, of the victim was mainly uh, uh, for them to be Yugoslav partisans. So uh, Jews were uh, mainly held for a while in Rizera in transit to other camps where they were exterminated, whereas the main victims were um, Yugoslav partisans, communist fighters. Rizera's furnishings, the documents and the truck whose exhaust pipes supplied the noxious fumes to the underground chamber were incinerated in the night of 25th of April 1945 by Nazis abandoning the site. However, the structure and walls of this sturdy 19th century building survived the blast and a ghostly outline of the crematorium can still be uh, discerned on the main wall. Um, you see to uh, the left the, uh, a photo of Riziera in recent years and you can see actually the outline of the crematorium which is in close up in the um, image to the right. Um, now the, the memorialization of Riziera has been a work in progress since the end of the war. The trial to establish responsibilities and bring perpetrators to justice was mired from the word go in procedural delays, technicalities and controversies. So much so that these controversies underpinned Riziera's memorialization. One of the most contentious initiatives taken by the judiciary was to establish a very clear distinction between victims. So the victims, um, uh, According to the trial, the victims were not just victims, but they had special status. On the one hand, you had so-called innocent victims, um, meaning depoliticized civilians. On the other hand, you had culpables, culpable victims, meaning politicized fighters, typically Yugoslav partisans. Read to an empty room on 29th of April 1917, one sentence alone was passed at the end of the trial to Riziera's last commandant, Josef Oberhauser. The trial became entangled in further polemics and protestations. As you can imagine, you know, only one person is deemed to be culpable, but this person, uh, it later transpires, cannot be extradited because of uh, legal, um, the legal framework between Italy and Germany. Uh, Josef Oberhauser could not be extradited, so he never, um, he was never um, extradited to Italy, he never paid for his crimes and continued to, to serve beer in his beer keller in Munich until he died in the mid-1980s. So this trial was really quite disastrous and, and as you can imagine a sort of potent um, driver for a very fraught and broken memorialization. The trial was later nicknamed the Nuremberg Monkey. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to Riziera? What, how, how was it memorialized and monumentalized? How was it uh, transformed into a national monument? The image you see, uh, the two images to the right, are uh, images of the building inside as it is today, which is really stayed pretty much as it was. To the left, you see um, two wings, two concrete wings that uh, constitute a passageway for the visitor to enter and to visit the site of, of the Riziera. And this site, um, this uh, monumentalization has been called the Creative Restoration, carried out by the architect Romano Boico and his team, who purported to do a light touch restoration. So, the idea was to leave the building, and they left the building exactly, pretty much as it was left by the Nazis when they left in 1945. And the only initiative, as it were, was the erection of the two pillars, the passageway. Now, I'm not entirely sure about this, but I'm aware that there is uh, an important monument um, in the Jewish cemetery in Belgrade, erected in 1952 by uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich that also has a corridor, a passageway into, into, the, into the cemetery. So I wonder, I mean this, I'm not sure about this, I need to do more research about this, but I wonder if the template 
for this particular um, you know, visual strategy of the passageway, the gateway into the camp um, is, is uh, Bogdanovich's um, own monument. So this uh, creative restoration of Boiko, the visual strategy emphasized the material void of the site, its vacuity and isolation, eliciting empathy and inviting respectful silence. The idea to bring Rizierra's memories to peace by way of a featureless and abstract remake was criticized as it seemed to be an attempt to bypass the polemics and the missions which marred the trial in particular. Uh, it seemed that Boiko wanted, to some, to some critics, it seemed that Boiko wanted to neuter the site, to strip it of its tragic memories, erasing Rizierra's status as, as it's been variously described, a Bactinian chronotope, a symbolic crossroads, a tectonic fault, a volcano belching out incandescent memorial material. And I'm quoting here from existing literature that describes Rizierra in this very heightened terms. And yet, the visual strategy here seems to be doing the opposite, you know, to try and sort of turn down, um, uh, turn down the, 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 um, the emotions around, around Rizier. So in other words, in the words of Baxendal, the lamination collapses and refigures time and time again a magmatic tectonics of memory. Today, Rizierra is a national monument, however, it is rather marginalized, both in public discourse and school curricula. Remember, there's a, there's a sort of amnesia that you know, concerns Rizera. It's not very present. In its presence in literary fiction is discreet. There are some um, um, st short stories that have been written about La Rizera, but not many. It's quite, um, it's quite uh, sparse, unlike what happens to the Feuve, as we will see in a moment. So there's an archaeology of public and individual memories that continue to sediment upon the Riziera, sparingly and in literary fiction alone. Now, we, I did say the disclaimer, these two sites obviously are not related at all. However, public commemoration has nonetheless tried to entangle the Riziera and the Feuber sites. Two sites that have become divided by competing annual commemorations and celebrations. Okay? So, at some point, it's been decided that Riziera was going to be celebrated on the 27th of January, which is International Holocaust Day, of course. And there's a ceremony to, that takes place on the Riziera premises, usually uh, attended by authorities of the Italian Republic and the Jewish community locally on International Holocaust Day. Victims of the Feuerbeck, on the other hand, are celebrated in a competing memorial event that happens two weeks later, more or less, on 10th of February every year, at the monumental site of Feuerba di Basovica. And this ceremony is a legacy of uh, Silvio Berlusconi's uh, government, who set up this particular uh, ceremony as a sort of regular event and, uh, and is usually attended by um, uh, exponents of extreme right-wing and right-wing political parties. So in patent um, disassociation from um, the, uh, the um, memorial events at the Rizierna site. Now, this initiative was so successful that um, it's now become part of national mourning. In Italy, you have a day that mourns victims of Riziera, and two weeks later, the day that mourns the victims of the Fonte. So these competing acts of commemoration ferment what Dan Stone calls a politics of memory wars. The broken memories of post-conflict Trieste reverberate politically to this day in this region, in Italy, and in Europe, particularly in Eastern, in Eastern Europe, but more widely. We come to the Feuerbe sites. We already said they were, these were pits and crevices. They're part of the geological fabric of the region, so they were not, 
they were not dug, these, these holes in the ground were not dug especially, they were, they were there. And these uh, yellow dots that you see scattered on the left hand side here are uh, sites of, of some of these um, uh, geological uh, crevices. They're basically abyss, abysses or crevices, often very deep and, and, um, and very steep and, and spiky and, and go, going down um, uh, a few uh, hundred meters in some, in some cases down underground. So what is the geopolitical context of the Feuerbe? Uh, Feuerbe were deployed as sites of torture and collectors of human remains in the context of violent confrontations between Yugoslavia and Italy in 1943 and 1945. Now, um, after the First World War, it, I need to sort of take a little step back um, to explain that after the First World War, Italy was allocated a substantial portion of the multi-ethnic borderland in this region uh, as spoils of war. So th there's, there's a sort of large region that was uh, um, mainly part uh, Croatian, part Slovenian, part Italian, ethnically, that was allocated to Italy. Of course, the fascist rule ensues in, from 1922, and the fascists pursued an aggressive policy of nationalization of the, particularly of the Slovenian and Croatian communities, of the non-Italian communities in this area. Fast forwarding to the end of the Second World War, where Italy finds itself in a very different position, fascism having collapsed and, and uh, you know, having to retreat towards inland Italy, um, you find escalating national clashes. And many of these national and ethnic clashes took place at the Feuerbe sites, at the sites of these pits. Reprisals and vendettas were also uh, carried out. Many of these atrocities were committed at the voracious mouth of these caves. Feuerbe today continued to scar the post-conflict landscape, both materially and symbolically, brought to the limelight by competing politics and relative memorial attritions. And this is one of the main, uh, the most uh, prominent and monumentalized site. Uh, it's called Foiva di Bazovica. As you can see, it's a, it's a monument, it's a national monument now. And um, uh, on the top left uh, image, um, there's a, a sort of diagram that shows what is uh, etched on the stone in the bottom left image that shows um, the alleged uh, content of this volume because of course, uh, uh, as you will see, the um, uh, controversies and debates about the content and the numbers and the victims and identities rages on, you know, flip is, continues to this day. Like Nora's Lieu de Memoir, Feuerbe have been instrumentalized as bastions, sustaining the identitarian politics of competing groups in Trieste. So there's an attempt to uh, own, from, of, from competing ethnic and national groups, to own the Feuerbe as, as their own sites. As such, Feuerbe act as implacable memory machines, regurgitating a plethora of voices along the layers of human remains, animal carcasses, and scraps of war machinery that are contained. Feuerbe continue to this day to generate news, opinions, rebuttals, and also stories and legends. There's a colossal amount of facts, fictions, and opinions constantly published and republished, revised and updated. I've put on this slide just a few of a colossal amount of bibliography, some of it really serious historical research, others uh, diaries of, um, or personal memories, others very tendentious and you know, sort of, um, uh, partisan views of the Feuerbe. There's a whole constellation, a whole galaxy of literature on the Feuerbe, both uh, fiction and non-fiction. So unlike Rizera, the Feuerbe loom large in literary fiction. 
So is literature able to open the transcultural vistas disavowed by the schizophrenic public rituals performed at the Riziera and the Foibe sites? Now, the literary culture of this region was polarized both before and after the First World War. Working in physical proximity to one another, Slovenian and Italian intellectuals, for example, pursued comparable agendas, but incommunicado. They didn't really speak to each other. They were often quite similarly, um, you know, that their, their pursuits were very similar, but there was no communication. I'm thinking, for instance, of two key figures. Uh, one is the poet Shrechko Kosovel that I've already mentioned earlier, and another one is Shipio Slatoper, who are pretty much contemporaries, uh, working, um, well, Shrechko Kosovel from just outside Trieste, but working from the Karst region uh, in close proximity, and both very um, uh, intent in to um, assert a cultural legitimacy for Slovenian culture, for Italian culture, both extremely um, inclined towards a European identity as well as, a, as their own cultural, specific national cultural identity, and yet not really overlapping or not communicating at all, with no crossovers. And uh, my chapter in the already mentioned volume Peripheral Modernisms addresses some of these issues, which uh, Patricia and I will um, bring out um, in, in future. So, uh, to return to the Feuerbe side, um, modern and contemporary fiction, I mean, to literature about the Feuerbe, uh, literary fiction, modern and contemporary fiction centered on the Feuerbe includes authors such as Gianni Stuparic, Enrico Molovic, Giuseppe Svalduz, Ezio Mestrovic, Giulio Angioni, Lina Galli, and many, many others. So there's been a sort of plethora of, um, of literary fiction written about these uh, kids. Before the war, fiction suggestively evoked the Feuerbe in magic realist style, as terminals of personal and collective tragedies, suicides, personal and political vendettas. These pits evoked spectral and malignant encounters embedded in ancestral folklore and popular memory. One of the most vivid examples predating the political atrocities of the 1940s is a short story entitled La Grotta, which means the cave, by uh, Gianni Stupage, the author that you see featured in both these photographs. The one to the right, you see Gianni Stupage with his brother Carlo during the First World War. Stuparic's story, La Grotta, centers on the expedition of three young men on the cast mountainous plateau near Trieste and the tragic accidental downfall of two of them in the abyss. A uterine symbolism takes over when Lucio, the survivor, is helped by a teacher whose intervention is framed as an eternal cocooning and redemption. A symbolic equation of the foiber with the maternal uterus was a cliché of this literature, resurfacing to some extent in more recent production. I mean, this is a 1930s, I didn't say, but yes, it's a sort of 1940s a story that predates the atrocities that, um, that, we, uh, that we just looked at. On the other hand, moving forward you know, a few decades, in the 1990s, we have a novel by Carlos Gorlon, who's a Friulian author, um, and the novel, uh, uh, published in 1992, is entitled La Foiba Grande, the Big Foiba. And in my opinion, this novel is a bit of a faux pas in an otherwise, you know, wise and uh, on the part of an otherwise equanimous and wise intellectual and writer. The novel, in fact, centers on an aberrant evil force that the Feuerbe caves are purported to hide within. But this is not a folkloric force, as you might have found in Stuparic's story. But this uh, aberrant evil mystique of the Feuerbe now lies on an artfully constructed dichotomy, pitting the Romanità of these lands of romanceness against the so-called Balkanicita or Balkanness of these lands. So, so I think Sgorlon is really, you know, 
walking on quicksands here because he's trying to, to create this idea that there's, there's a sort of Western, there are Western values here to be protected, that the foiva sort of symbolizes these Western values against the sort of bul you know, the balkanization of these lands. Of course, the liter this literary device betrays the chronology of this novel, which was written in the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in fact, the derogatory use of the, of the word Balkan and Balkanization, as is noted by Todorova again, came only at the end of the Cold War and the eclipse of state communism in Eastern Europe. So you could call Goron's reading as a sort of Orientalist approach, it's an Orientalist reading, and it's underpinned by a covert de demonization of Eastern Europe. The rift between Catholic or Italian fighters and communist Yugoslav partisans, which of course is, is an artfully created rift because there were many Italians fighting alongside Yugoslav partisans and vice versa, there were Catholic Yugoslavs, conveys the author's indictment of the Balkanized neighbors pressing at the threshold of Trieste. So these neighbors are perceived as an eroding force on the city's occidental values. The divisive memories of the Feuerbe lend this narrative leverage, adding more layers of broken and unreconciled memories, the rain. So I'm moving towards the conclusion now. And I really don't want to end this lecture on a you know, on a, on a downer. <laughs> I'd like to end it with an upper. Um, and I think there is, you know, there is, there is, uh, there's some good signs, hopeful signs for, for the future. Um, in present past, Husson again, refers to Italo Calvino's invisible cities as paradigmatic of the experience of the city as both a material and an imaginary space. Trieste inhabits this elusive space, a powerful generator of memories, myths and rhetorics to this day. Despite these interruptions, however, I believe a redemptive force is emerging. New structural directions of capital, the shifting coordinates of globalization, as well as new migrations, are currently reformulating Trieste's multiple identities, encoding new memories or new strategies of memorialization. One of the most notable agents of the shift is the contemporary novelist uh, Lily Amber Laila Vardia, who is featured in my last slide. Born in Mumbai and a resident of Trieste since 1986, Vardia is a translator, uh, she's a teacher, she's also an author, a creative writer, who writes narrative fiction in Italian, a second language. Her diary, entitled Come diventare italiani in 24 ore, il diario di un'aspirante italiana, How to Become an Italian National in 24 Hours, The Diary of a Would-Be Italian, is an ironical tongue-in-cheek expose of existing cultural, linguistic, and identitarian stereotypes. Focusing on food and language acquisition as key sites of migrant rupture, Vadia's work debunks the Middle European cliché and the essentialist myth of an internal polarity of Triestian culture. So Triestian culture, hopefully, is no longer polar, you know, divided, clashing, but multi, you know, finally multi, plural. Through the medium of irony, Vadia explodes canonical dichotomies, center versus periphery, national versus regional, monocultural versus transcultural, derailing stale local discourses, reorienting old binaries, seeking new dialogues. So today's much maligned globalization may actually suit Trieste well. And I'm thinking of very many uh, important initiatives that um, emanate from Trieste and from that region today. I'm thinking of the United College of the Adriatic, which is uh, an advanced study school located near Trieste that welcomes students from all over Europe, particularly the east of Europe, and it's a hub of, of research. Um, there are very many scientific institutions. There's the synchrotron, 
um, there is a, a very important astronomical observatory. So there's an awful lot of scientific research that happens in this, in this region. These institutions are not merely attraction for the regional economy, but most importantly, they're now generating new cultural ecologies of their own. So abandoning the memory wars fought over non-dialogical memorial sites, such as Rizera and the Foibe, the exchanges prefigured in Vadia's work are the laboratory of a new culture. These exchanges hail a genuinely transcultural episteme predicated on exchanges and fruitful conversations rather than on fractures and divisive laminations. Thank you.